We'll call to order tonight's regular meeting of the Minot City Council. Roll call. Berg? Here. Francois? Here. Hedberg? Here. Janser? Here. Kozin? Here. Lehner? Here. Olson? Here. Panko? Here. Quadribula? Here. Schuler? Here. Shimento? Here. Sidma? Here. Straight? Here. With us? Here. Barney? Here. Number two, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number three is the approval of the minutes from the May 1st and May 23rd uh, council meeting. Mr. Mayor. Alderman Transfog. Mr. Mayor, I move item three and four. Second. Seconded by Laner. Any discussion? Call the roll. Transfog. Yes. Hedberg. Yes. Janser. Yes. Cozen. Yes. Laner. Yes. Olson. Yes. Panko. Yes. Padragula. Yes. Schuler. Yes. Shimento. Yes. Sitma. Yes. Straight. Yes. With us? Yes. Berg? Yes. Motion passes uh, item number five, our personal appearances. This is a uh, place on the agenda where anybody can come and address the city council on any item that is not on our agenda already. Any item that is not on the agenda for tonight. Is there anybody out there that wants to address the council? Seeing so you no know one. Item number six is the mayor's report. I have a brief report for you this evening. Uh, a few activities I've been involved with. On May 3rd, uh, we had the Minot Air Force Base Alumni Reception <coughs> in D.C. Uh, attending the event along with a delegation from Minot was Senator Hoven, Senator Heitkamp, General Dorman from the Guard, and uh, the mayor of Grand Forks, uh, an event that is designed to uh, uh, keep in touch with the uh, upper management of the Air Force that has been in Minot. Uh, we had a very good event and, um, and great support from the congressional delegation. May 5th, I did the Music Educators Welcome at the Grand. Uh, they asked me not to sing, and uh, I didn't. Um, May 11th, uh, Alderman uh, Strait and I uh, went up to the uh, Church of the Living God and met with Bishop Anderson and Pastor Windham, who, uh, as you may recall, they experienced some vandalism at their church. And uh, we went up there to uh, visit with them and uh, reassure them that that was not the voice of the community and that uh, we are indeed better than that. And they were, they were wonderful people and um, um, accepted that uh, very graciously. Um, in also, in May, the middle of May, I uh, traveled to uh, Poland and met with two companies, Grupo Zadi in Puave, which is a fertilizer company that has been to uh, North Dakota before and is interested in the uh, gas resources of the uh, Bakken and the uh, agriculture market in North Dakota and maybe bridging that with a fertilizer product. We also met with Robot Aviation in Warsaw, who's in interested in creating a manufacturing facility in, uh, in the United States, and uh, they're planning on a site visit to uh, Minot during the summer. May 30th meeting with Senator Hoven on some of the later phases of flood protection and identifying possible funding sources, a very productive meeting and uh, he's uh, working hard to help us identify those additional funding sources. Also on May 30th, I represented the city during the Marine League chartering ceremony at the VFW, and uh, that's pretty much my, uh, my activities, but in addition to that, I want to recognize Officer Foley. Stand and come forward, young man. I like being able to tell them what to do instead of the other way around when they're giving me speeding tickets. Uh, <laughs> Officer Foley uh, is, so was nominated for going above and beyond uh, duty, uh, joined the force in 2010. Uh, he is a field training officer, uh, an instructor, and has become a member of the crisis negotiations team. Um, he <laughs> 
as a tangible example of his work ethic, in 2016, Officer Foley wrote 54% more traffic and arrest citations than the next highest producing ticket writer. <laughs> oh, good. I'm on my coin bag. Uh, <laughs> beyond the, his accolades as a peace officer, he is active in Boy Scouts of America as an adult leader in Troops 411 and 416 and uh, often takes time and spends uh, going, uh, camping with the scouts in northern Minnesota. Um, he formed the Regional Eagle Scout Association within the last six months um, and um, created law enforcement explorer post uh, through the Minot Police Department. He's a de dedicated member of the PD and a great asset to the city and uh, a great community servant. So help me welcome <laughs> My notes for my report is uh, before you should be a list of appointments and reappointments. Alderman Jansen, approve your appointments. Second. Seconded by Olson. Any discussion? Any discussion? Call the roll. Jansen? Yes. Cosen? Yes. Lehner? Yes. Olson? Yes. Panko? Yes. Pajabula? Yes. Schuler? Yes. Shimento? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Straight? Yes. Withers? Yes. <coughs> Berg? Yes. Francois? Yes. Hedberg? Yes. That concludes my report. Uh, City Manager, Mr. Berry? Well, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, it's my pleasure to present to you the June. Uh, City Manager's Report. With that, I'll start with some important dates. Uh, June is going to be a busy month for us, uh, both administratively and also with the Council. Uh, it's probably one of the more active months, uh, Council meeting-wise, since we have the change in governance in addition to the election. So your dates are here on the screen for you. Uh, a couple highlights I'll point out. The election on June 13th, that's going to happen from 7 in the morning to 7 p.m. at the City Auditorium. We'd encourage all of uh, members of our community to, to uh, come out and vote. Uh, there'll be a special city council meeting confirming the canvassing results on June 21st, first, rather, here at noon in the council chambers. Uh, we'll have city council orientation on June 22nd from 4 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. at the city auditorium. <coughs> so we're highly encouraging uh, returning council members and any potential new council members to attend the City Council orientation. I'll talk about that a little bit more in the presentation later. Uh, there'll be the City Council reorganization meeting that's gonna take place on June 27th at 6.30. Uh, and that's where we have the batoned uh, passing ceremony, if you will. And then uh, the Committee of the Whole, this will be our first Committee of the Whole meeting that's scheduled for June 28th at 4.15. Uh, I'll also talk to you about the meetings and the meeting schedule at the very end of our um, meeting today under other business. So <clears throat> we've uh, conducted the budget workshop over the last uh, couple weeks and uh, I'll, I'll update you on some of the takeaways uh, for those of you who couldn't make the workshop here in just a moment. But again, just reminding you <clears throat> as we go through the progression here <laughs> and trans transitioning the council uh, from a 14 member council to a six member council and going through the election uh, that the uh, as I just mentioned, the June election, and our June 13th election, council orientation on the 22nd, and then the first meeting of the Committee of the Whole, which will be the first meeting of all the City Council, uh, will be on June 28th. Here's the budget workshop takeaways. We split the budget workshops into two sections. The first one was 
really focusing on some changes to our community and uh, discussing the revenue portion and financial uh, condition of the city of Minot. Uh, the second takeaway, or the second meeting was to talk about expenses and, and sort of future considerations. So I wanted to just uh, get this out for all of you. Uh, some of the changes to the community which have driven our current economic uh, situation, both regionally and locally, uh, in, involve, of course, the uh, flood of 2011 and the continued recovery efforts that we've uh, been pursuing since that time. And, of course, the economic boom associated with the oil and then uh, and now recession, if you will, locally uh, based on uh, some of the oil activity. Uh, some very positive points that came out of the budget workshops that we were able to recognize is that this city has done a phenomenal job in seeking and acquiring grants to the tune of tens and tens of millions of dollars. Actually, all, all summed up over $100 million over the last 10 years, which is phenomenal. We have a very strong credit rating currently, the highest you can have for a city of this size. Um, we have quite a bit of money in reserves. Uh, we have advanced a lot of efforts on the flood control projects, and I've been mentioning those along the way in the reports. Uh, we've had proportionate growth in all <coughs> sectors of the city. We haven't, therefore, seen any one sector grow faster than the other, say, public safety or public works or administration. It's all been proportionate. Uh, and we've also added quite a bit of infrastructure across the 10-year period uh, to accommodate growth, uh, keeping in mind that we have doubled almost nearly doubled the size of the city over the past 10 years and uh, doubled to tripled the amount of infrastructure that we've added over the same time period. Uh, we've had over that 10 year period, which is kind of what we focused on, we've had a 32% reduction in the mill levy over the, just the last five years. And uh, we also have property tax subsidies uh, that are about 105% of our total sales taxes. We do underutilize special assessments in the city of Minot when compared to many of the other jurisdictions throughout North Dakota, and that may be something that we might have to discuss more through the budget season or budget process this year. Uh, when we talk about forecasted revenues, we know that uh, some of the challenges we have are reduced sales taxes. Uh, we have state aid, which is uh, being significantly reduced, both in formulas set by the North Dakota legislature, as well as, say, surge funding and other, other forms. Uh, grant awards are going to be reducing over time, uh, and of course property tax valuations are down as well. On the takeaways for the second session, we talked mostly about uh, the expense side of the operation. We know that we have some pretty big expenses coming up that we've been planning for for some time, including flood control, uh, the Northwest Area Water Supply, lots of new infrastructure uh, still on the horizon. Uh, and then increased maintenance and operations as well as personnel expenses associated with all the infrastructure and growth that we've experienced over the last 10 years. That infrastructure has to be maintained ongoing now, uh, so that increases our operating costs. Uh, we do have some uncaptured revenues that we focused on. About 3,500 undeveloped lots, but serviced lots are, are out there in our community. These are ready to build on lots that we've extended services to but are not receiving property tax dollars from, develop, from the developed property taxes, uh, sales taxes, uh, fees, and uh, utility rates from. So we have lots of infrastructure out there, lots of ready to build on lots, uh, but we're not receiving the revenue for that, but we are well poised for that. Uh, we know that moving forward our budget's going to be challenging. We're going to have to look at a lot of different expense and revenue uh, options. Uh, but we do have a sound approach, and I presented the budget priorities uh, and approach to uh, the, those who attended the workshops, <clears throat> and I think those have been sent out also to you as well um, last month. Uh, future considerations, we are going to be moving the city towards financing um, over a long term, meaning we're going to want to project and model our um, expense and revenue projections so that we can have a longer term view to make uh, adjustments sooner than later and th therefore make those adjustments more incremental. Uh, moving to the council orientation, <clears throat> the purpose behind having the council, city council orientation uh, is several fold. Uh, we want to discuss and make sure it's clear that the roles and responsibilities of the positions uh, are, are clear and understood. We want to discuss city policies and procedures, Robert's rules of order and other basic um, uh, information about uh, conducting business with the city. Open meetings and records laws are also going to be discussed. We'll have short presentations from each department which will provide an overview of uh, their operation. And then we'll also outline citywide challenges and provide several helpful resources 
uh, to help new council members and returning council members uh, come up to speed and remain up to speed with city business. Moving on to City of Minot news, uh, most of you have uh, become aware that we are under voluntary water restrictions. Uh, the dry weather that we've had over the last uh, several weeks uh, has uh, been relentless, and so water demands have gone up considerably. <clears throat> so we are asking that um, we 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 are asking residents to please curb, uh, in a voluntary basis, their water use uh, and conform to lawn watering, uh, which is on alternative days. Again, keeping in, in, in mind that even numbered homes should water on Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. Odd number homes. Uh, should water on Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. And of course, all homes can water on Sundays. Um, next, I want to talk about the City of Minot newsletter. This is something that's been in the works for several months. The, la the first edition went out last month. Uh, we had over 1,000 subscribers. Subscribers, rather. There was a uh, read rate of about 35%, which is pretty good, considering the industry average is about 28%. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be sending out the next edition. Uh, this coming Thursday. So uh, if you or your neighbors want to get, uh, if you haven't already or your neighbors haven't signed up already, please let us know. You can sign up through the city's website. Uh, just a little point to make, uh, Alderman Laner's history about Third Street was the most read article in the city newsletter, so we'll appreciate your contribution. Um, upcoming stories are listed there. I won't go through them. Um, Lastly, I wanted to uh, inform you that I'm going to be uh, conducting a developer's forum. Uh, the date has not yet been determined. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got an opportunity here where we're going to try to invite a number of different developers uh, and the business, um, or excuse me, the Building Contractors Association representatives to come in and give us feedback about our development process. This is one of the goals we've had for Public Works Engineering and Planning for some time. Uh, as part of that work, I'd like to uh, ensure that we bring uh, these industry representatives to uh, come in and tell us what their experiences are and uh, where they think that we might be able to make improvements. We'll take that information, use it as both an education session both ways, uh, and then take what we can from that and incorporate the results of that into a, a, a business improvement process. So uh, we expect that to happen sometime in July at this point, but uh, we're still working on dates that work for everybody. Uh, invitations will go out to various developers in the BCA uh, as soon as we can get dates uh, that, that uh, seem to work for as many people as possible. Uh, I was asked at the last city council meeting to follow up on two items, so I wanted to provide, provide those items to you tonight. First was council chambers improvements. <clears throat> there was some concerns about uh, the Americans with Disability Act compliance with this room. Uh, and of course, as you might know, uh, this room is uh, not uh, the most accessible and could use improvements. Although it is um, acceptable as a grandfather facility uh, and would be required to be updated if we were to undertake any uh, substantial improvements, we could, however, consider substantial improvements now, including building a ramp to allow disabled members of our community, should they desire to serve on the council or committee or commission of that matter, uh, access to the dais. Uh, we also talked um, about a ADA compliant custom built podium here so that people in wheelchairs or other have other dis disabilities could also come and engage in the public process more easily. Uh, I invited Indep uh, Scott from Independence Inc. to attend a meeting with our building superintendent. We walked through a couple of different ideas, designs, and whatnot. We estimate the cost for both the ADA ramp and the uh, custom-built podium to range between twenty and twenty-five thousand uh, dollars. <laughs> we also have been talking internally about some audio-video upgrades to this building, or excuse me, this uh, room, and uh, some of those includes cameras that we'd like to add to uh, get us better angles and more visibility uh, for the community, since we live stream these as well as archive them. Uh, better audio equipment for folks who might have hearing impairments as well. Uh, better projection, the particularly document projection, which has been a problem. And improving the way that this podium works from an AV standpoint. It's not the most easy, easily um, manageable um, presentation podium that, uh, that we could have. So uh, we've been talking about these uh, various improvements. Those improvements will run us around thirty to $40,000 for the AV upgrades. and. Um, 
so that brings us to the next thing. How would we pay for this? <clears throat> well, there's two options that uh, we can consider and, and maybe several others. Uh, one of them is to consider sales tax community facilities fund. Uh, so we'd be looking at maybe upwards of 60 to $65,000 uh, via that program uh, should, the, should that uh, be competitive and be awarded. Alternatively, if it's important to the city council, we can work to try to include it uh, in next year's budget. So um, please let me know your thoughts about that, you know, either now or offline, if you will. There was another follow-up item that uh, I was asked to report back on. This is the Vista House. So <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, the city purchased the property located at 338 Walder Street. It's located at the intersection of Broadway and 4th, more or less. Um, this home was one of the last homes in that area, if you look here on the left of your map. Uh, and so it became sort of isolated, and the city felt like at the time, as I've been informed, that because it kind of stuck out there, it made sense to also acquire that building as well. Since the building's in pretty good shape, uh, there were some ideas as to what the building could be used for into the future, including a flood history museum, a visitor center, a gift shop, or, or anything else that the city wanted to use. Currently, the home is occupied by two of our VISTAs, our VISTA workers with the city. Uh, and so I just wanted to give you that information so you had it. Uh, if the city council should desire to purpose that building in some way, shape, or form going into the future, that'd be something that you all would want to discuss and work through, and then, and then we can uh, work with you to come up with any, uh, to evaluate any alternatives and, and uh, help come to a recommendation. Next, uh, I want to talk to you about downtown parking structures. A uh, couple updates here. <clears throat> the, uh, the city staff met with Cyprus representatives uh, over several meetings uh, during the week of May the 22nd. These meetings were long. Um, there was a lot of information discussed. Uh, we had been waiting for these meetings for some time. Uh, we were promised that Steve Larson, uh, essentially the head of Cyprus, was going to attend these meetings, and that's the reason they'd been pushed off for three months. Uh, when it finally came to scheduling, Mr. Larson and his team said they would all be available to meet with us. When we show up to the meeting, Mr. Larson was absent. Uh, they, we did have him on speakerphone for about uh, five to six minutes before he told us he had other more important business to attend to. <laughs> so uh, we were not able to continue the conversation with Mr. Larson present, but we continued for another four and a half hours uh, working through a four-page agenda. Uh, and with types of things we discussed were operations and management, construction of the facility, uh, that's the parking facility, uh, the apartment construction that's supposed to be following, uh, the financial situation uh, between Cyprus and, uh, of course, some reconciliation of the finances with the city. You should know that we uh, issued a payment demand in the amount of about $3.4 million to Cyprus. That includes uh, outstanding uh, rent that was supposed to be paid in October of last year uh, that uh, the city invoiced them for to the tune of about $260,000. Uh, they are now in breach of contract, uh, so we have noticed them that they are in breach. Unfortunately, the contract does allow for them to have a four-month cure period, so we're working through that cure period. Uh, they may be able to bring the, their compliance back in with the contract. Uh, and then, of course, the remainder of the funds are associated with cost overruns that the city experienced in bringing the construction of the parking ramps to fruition. And uh, those costs were not to be borne by the city. So we have billed Cyprus for those costs. Uh, as you can, might imagine, uh, uh, we're going to have to work through that issue moving forward. And I'll keep you updated as more information comes available. Uh, so that gets us through finances and specific performance. <clears throat> One of the things that came up in our meeting uh, as we talked about the apartment construction, was that the uh, Cypress representatives have informed us that they cannot build the apartments without the city reconsidering the ownership structure that they have as contemplated in the agreements uh, with Cypress. So essentially, they pitched an idea uh, that follows. They would like for the city to give both parking ramps to the Cypress um, free of charge and allow them to hold those parking ramps as collateral for future financing of the apartments and they would hold those parking ramps as collateral for the duration of the lease that we have with Cyprus which has 97 years on it at which point they promise to return the parking ramps to us. 
go. Uh, I said that they may be better suited to come and explain all of these details to the city council at a future meeting, uh, and they will, uh, they may get that opportunity. The mayor and I will be meeting with the Cyprus leadership, including hopefully Mr. Larson, to talk through this uh, concept a little bit more and uh, vet its um, efficacy. So uh, that's what I have for you on the downtown parking structures. Uh, actually, one other Before thing. Before you go on from that, yes, sir. Um, Mr. Berry, I think it's very, very important that you clarify that the city is not interested in that. I, I, I want to make sure that that is crystal clear and uh, that the council understands that and the community understands that that with the track record that we have, that we are not interested in relinquishing any of our assets so that they can get their financing. Correct. So I want to make that clear. Thank you. Yes, Continue. Mr. Mayor, thank you for that. Uh, and we, we did uh, contemplate that in our conversation with them. We even asked the question, so if that's not considered by the city council favorably, what happens next? And uh, essentially they said, uh, we don't really know. So. Um, in any event, yes, uh, we made it pretty clear that uh, there wasn't a very good uh, impression of Cyprus and encouraged them to go look at some of the blogs that have been out and some of the information that has come from the City Council Candidate Forum uh, responses or letters uh, so they could get a better sense of what the impression of Cyprus was inside the city. Uh, one thing that's improved uh, on the parking ramps is uh, we complain quite a bit and have been for some time about the janitorial issues, the maintenance and operation of the facility. I'm pleased to report that there have been some improvements made. Uh, we are still monitoring those improvements and we are looking for long-term sustained improvement of the maintenance and uh, oversight of the um, garages. But at this point, there have been some improvements there, so we'll continue to monitor that. Okay, with that, uh, I won't go into all the details of the construction update because I feel like we're getting long here as it is. Uh, but for the most part, uh, there have been, uh, you know, we continue with the construction activities around the city. Uh, most projects are uh, pretty well in schedule at this point in time. Uh, so I'll leave this with you. Uh, we can print this out. Of course, it's available online as well, so I won't go through all the construction updates. I'd like to move to a couple other things. Um, one of the things I'd like to, uh, inter to do at this point in time as we talk about the NDR program is introduce our program manager, Mr. John Zakian. Uh, John has extensive background in economic and housing development, finance, municipal services, and disaster recovery uh, consulting. Since April of 2013, Mr. Zakian has been a contract consultant working for the New York City Office of Management and Budget, providing guidance and uh, city administration to HUD's $4.2 billion community development block grant disaster recovery plan following the devastation caused by the 2012 uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, event. Mr. Zakian earned his Bachelor of Arts in Government from Bates College in Lewiston, Maine in 1972, and he's completed his Master's of Public Administration from New York's Pace University in 1985. With that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Zakian to the community and also to the City Council. Um, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity of this position. Um, in addition to you having a very robust group of citizens coming here today, it was my intent from the very beginning to establish a physical proof of my commitment to you that I will be very visible and accessible, hence I'm sitting up in front. Um, I believe it is very important for transparency in this program. It is extremely important to the future of this city. I know we have, and I've told this to the city manager, he's kind of reinforced it to me. We have five and a, five and a half years to spend this, these funds under the Appropriation Act. Um, my goal uh, in coming here to serve you and the citizens is to deploy all the $74 million in as beneficial and effective and efficient way as possible for all the citizens of Minot and to do it in sooner than five and a half years and make my job irrelevant. That is my primary purpose in being here. And I'm looking forward to working with all of you, with the city manager and all the departments and advancing this very important set of programs that he'll go over. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, so on the NDR program, buyouts and acquisitions are continuing as normal. Uh, we're going to talk about the downtown gathering space under other business tonight, so I'll save for that. Affordable housing and the family homeless shelter RFPs are continuing, so there's really been no changes uh, in regard to trajectory of, uh, of uh, progress here. Uh, but the details are, are included uh, for your uh, perusing at a later time. I did want to also alert you that uh, we are going to have a visit uh, from HUD uh, coming up here between June 26th and June 30th. They're going to be conducting a CDBG, this Community Development Block Grant, on-site uh, audit. Uh, this audit is just routine. It is not because of anything that uh, the city has done or allegedly done. But I want to put everyone's mind at rest there. This is really just a, a compliance audit. Uh, they'll spend time and focus uh, that time with us on essentially looking at rules, requirements, uh, as, as uh, the HUD program is supposed to be administered. So uh, we expect to spend some time there. We'll use it also as an opportunity to um, uh, advance conversations on the NDR front, although they are not looking at NDR specifically. Uh, we'll have some members there that, uh, from the HUD office that will be uh, familiar with the NDR program, so we'll do some consultation with them at that time as well. Uh, next up, let's talk about flood control. Um, <clears throat> I don't need to go through all the numbers again with you. I just want to say that the sales tax ad hoc committee has been uh, reconvened and is meeting now to talk about how to finance the local share. Uh, there's been some interesting information that's come out of the committee. Tomorrow we'll be making a presentation uh, to talk with the sales tax ad hoc committee. Uh, the good news, bad news story is this, that uh, based on our financial modeling, as everyone pretty much expected, the half cent is not going to be enough to finance the local share. I don't think that's a surprise to everyone. Uh, however, the one cent is, uh, and that is for phases one through four and looking at a bond period of about 10 years. Uh, so there's some real benefits to shortening up the borrowing period. Uh, we'll be talking about all of those benefits and some of the details behind that uh, tomorrow. So. In some ways, I've let the cat out of the bag a little bit early, but all the details will come tomorrow on the Sales Tax Ad Hoc Committee. Again, that's June 6th at noon in Council Chambers. Uh, we are accepting Community Facilities Fund applications. This has been a question that has come uh, to our office many times. Uh, I cannot guarantee uh, to the community that, uh, that the Council or anyone else is going to approve any uh, or all of the applications, but I will just let you know, as we've been monitoring the fund, uh, we will have, as projected by the end of this fiscal year, about $4.8 million uh, available by fiscal year end. Uh, we have applications so far to have been turned in, that total request of about $3 million. Um, so what happens to the Community Facilities Fund going forward is something for the Sales Tax Ad Hoc Committee and, of course, you all to decide on. But I thought at least uh, just make mention that uh, at least we will be accepting applications. And those applications will be accepted until June 30th, uh, at which point uh, we'll close the acceptance of applications and turn, that, turn all applications over to the Community <coughs> Facilities Fund Committee for evaluation and recommendation. Uh, automation uh, is uh, well underway. We continue to have a tentative implementation schedule of July 17th. Uh, we do hope that we can meet that date. Some of the uh, vehicles are still in construction. And, uh, and that may be problematic but depending upon how much, uh, how, how many of the vehicles we can actually take delivery of before that date. Um, some people around the community continue to ask why we want to automate. I think it's become clear for most, but just to remind folks, you know, there are a number of reasons automation makes sense, including worker safety. I found this statistic kind, kind of interesting that sanitation employees account for only 22% uh, or excuse me, account for 22% of the workforce safety claims, but only make up 4% of our city workforce. Um, there's other improvements, as, as it's been mentioned many times, efficiency, beautification, uh, and of course, automation is the first step towards moving towards uh, curbside recycling. So we're positioning ourselves well for that. Uh, the fire department, my not fire department, uh, responded to the earth recycling fire a few weeks back, uh, rural fire. Uh, the one that took point on this and also worked with Burlington and others. Uh, we were asked to do monitoring of the air uh, and we found no substantial pollutants uh, in our monitoring. However, we did get several complaints from folks in and around the vicinity of, uh, of smells and uh, reactions. So, um, you know, we, we, we don't know, we don't know essentially the details around that other than to say based on the monitoring that we've done, 
that we, we didn't find anything out of compliance there. Um, essentially, the facility at Earth Recycling has been destroyed, and there's a lot of conversation as to whether or not it should or can be rebuilt. So there's some conversation occurring internally with the city right now to determine uh, what needs to happen uh, or what should happen going forward. Uh, so there'll be, uh, we'll have several consultations, um, I'm sure, with the members of Earth Recycling as we try to develop a path forward. Uh, one kind of interesting and uh, fun thing to report on is that uh, we had several volunteers help at the Minot International Airport to uh, green up and plant multiple trees, about 125 trees and shrubs uh, at the airport at a cost of about $38,000. Uh, this saved about $70,000 of budget that uh, was otherwise budgeted for this to be done by contractors. So again, working with uh, forestry, uh, and community volunteers from Rotary. I'm pleased to say that we were able to save substantial tax dollars and uh, get really, really great results at the Minot Airport. So I want to thank Rick and Deanna and all the team up at the Minot uh, Airport for uh, reaching out and engaging and involving our citizens in this important work. Um, other recognition, recognition I'd like to give is uh, uh, I want to thank Rod Romine and, and others from the Coffee Club that goes around and quietly mows in and around all of the city's entrance signs. There's five signs in total. This group has quietly maintained these signs for about 10 years. And you can see there are a number of, this, uh, number of individuals in this group, and it doesn't take them any time to get these signs done. Uh, they're very efficient and very prideful of the city, and uh, it was great to spend a short uh, afternoon with them, uh, you know, talking and, and watching them work. Uh, the signs, uh, it's really great, and I just wanted to point out, you know, we have a lot of really cool things going on in this community, and, and this, is, uh, this is one of them. Uh, we've already recognized Jared, but uh, I had this on here, just wanted to make sure um, we had that memorialized in the city manager's report. Uh, and with that, we'll move to the Minot Public Library. Uh, we did receive the North Dakota Star Library Award. Uh, this is a award that uh, we were one of three libraries across the state in our category to receive, so it's pretty prestigious, uh, which is great. Uh, and then also, if you weren't at the Building a Better Community Fair on June 3rd, that was a pretty widely attended and successful event as well. Uh, it was a kickoff to the summer reading program, and we also finalized the Build Minot campaign. We'll be talking about what to do with that uh, Build Minot uh, campaign information as we move forward. With that, I'll pause, uh, or stop rather, for any questions. I know it went a little bit long, because we had a lot to discover or to discuss this particular period. Any questions for the city manager? Hmm. Alderman Padragula. More in line of a comment. Um, just wanted to thank you for the very detailed reports you've been giving us, um, particularly about bad news. That's something we need to hear, the citizens need to hear. And especially wanted to recognize your financial uh, workshops that you held. I first started sit serving on the council in 1998, and these were the most informative, organized meetings I've ever attended by a city manager, and I think it's really important that people know that, and I certainly appreciate that in my service now of a year on the council. Um, just, just a very good job. It's very much appreciated, Tom. Thank you very much, Alderman Padugula. Anybody else? Alderman Stray? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I'll second that, Tom. And Tom, can you please look into the NDR money to see if we can fund the ADA accessible component here <coughs> and also the upgrades? Uh, I know that we're not going to relocate City Hall in, uh, overnight, but that seems to be a pressing need that could maybe be a short, small amendment to NDR. So that's something I'd like you to look into, please. Thank you, Mr. Alderman Strait. We'll, we'll look into that as well. Any other questions for the City Manager? Alderman Shimano. On the earth recycling issue, what does this, since it's outside the city limits, what does the city have to say or do about this? Um, Mr. Mayor and Alderman Shimento, the city, it is within inside the, the extraterritorial ter territorial area, so it's in our planning and zoning area. So we need to ensure compliance with our zoning and land use. And so with that, uh, this facility should be operating with an enclosed structure of some kind. It is not now since it burned down, so we'll need to talk about how they plan to operate, um, if they do plan to operate, and what needs to be done in order to bring them into compliance. Any other questions for the city manager? Thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks. Um, city attorney, I wanted to thank Stephanie for coming in uh, on, uh, on short notice to Bill in for Kelly, who had to get back home.
called out of town. Uh, Stephanie came in from attorney leave. Welcome. Thank you. Yes. Um, Mayor, members of the council, City Attorney Hendershot prepared a written report, and it's been included in your packets. And um, as the mayor mentioned, I've been out on maternity leave, so my knowledge of what's in this report is limited at the time, but <coughs> I can try to answer any questions that you may have and perform any follow-up research as needed. Any questions for City Attorney? Thank you. <coughs> Item number eight is consider the report of the Planning Commission. We have a motion. <coughs> Items one and two, any other items? For those of you in the audience, this means that uh, all the other items, uh, basically three through 13, will be passed as they came out of the Planning Commission. Items one and two will be pulled for separate discussion. If there are any other items you care to have pulled, uh, let me know now and I'll pull them. Seeing no one, uh, call the roll on the consent portion. Lehner? Yes. Olson? Yes. Panko? Yes. Padrigula? Yes. Jeweler? Yes. Shimento? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Street? Yes. Withis? Yes. Bird? Yes. Bransfog? Yes. Hedberg? Yes. Janser? Yes. Colson? Yes. Motion passes. Item number one is subdivide Northridge Villas Edition. We have a motion? Move it. Moved by Olson? Second. Seconded by Lehner. Discussion? 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 Anybody in the audience care to discuss this item? Yes, ma'am. Come forward, please. Your name and address, please. Good evening. My name is Angie Paness. I live at 709 27th Street Northwest. Just here to chat a little bit about the Northridge development. Um, I just have a little bit of a speech. Keep it short and sweet. Um, our neighborhood has been fighting this development since 2012. The land started on its egg, and it was proposed to change to an R4 zone. It did get changed to an R1, not R4, and that is what I believe it should stay, an R1. Single-family dwelling, 34 lots. All adjacent dwellings are single-family dwellings. This addition should match its surroundings. It is an extent of an R1, not a buffer zone leading to another zone. It should stay R1. The neighbors of 27th Street want this development to just stay in R1 zoning for traffic reasons and also to match its surroundings. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Blanas? Any questions? Thank you, ma'am. <coughs> yes, sir. Come forward, please. Mayor, uh, City Council members, my name is Steve Schmalz. I'm at 705 27th Street Northwest. And just to kind of follow up on what uh, Angie brought up, and but first off, my wife has sent a letter to most of you, and she uh, had to go out of town for a funeral this afternoon, so she wanted me to read this letter. To the city council members, in the past few weeks, I've sent letters trying to stop a zoning change in Northridge Village Villas development. This process started back in 2012, and or around the time I was told by three separate neighbors that Donna by Donna Bai's husband was an investor in this project. It has been brought to my attention today by Donna that I was misinformed and that in no way has her or her husband been investors in Northridge Villas. I apologize for misrepresenting this information or any difficulties that has caused Donna and her family. Sincerely, Lori Schmals. <coughs> Donna, you accept the apology? I do, thank you. Okay. So you. the other thing we just want to mention <coughs> is the future of 19th, what happens when the state closes that off. Where is the traffic going to go? Is it going to come down 27th, or are we going to pave sunset going north? You know, that's one of our major concerns too by changing this. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, any questions, uh, Mr. Mr. Schmaltz? No, oh, I'm sorry. I thought. Okay, thank you. No, you're good. Uh, anybody else in the audience? Mr. Hedberg, do you have a question, or can I let the people speak first? Yes, come forward, Mrs. By. Um, 
Um, good evening, Alderman. My name is Donna Bai. I am a representative from Houston Engineering, uh, representing our client, John Zimmerman. Uh, we have a very short uh, slideshow that we just want to update you on a few things and um, give you a synopsis of, of our project. As you can see, this project property is located in Northwest uh, Minot. It is adjacent to some single family residences as well as a legacy fourplex just across the street on 27th Street. Um, it is located at approximately 9th Avenue, um, just directly south of Eagles Landing. Um, during the past two months, we wanted to have you recognize that we had offered three neighborhood meetings um, on Saturdays throughout the month of um, March and April, uh, of which we had approximately 10 people show up at each of those meetings. Um, we had sent out a postcard with both uh, clients and myself's information on it um, for um, contact throughout that if they were not able to make those meetings. Um, Northridge, um, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit about the, the development. It is 34 lots currently. We're looking at a subdivision, a zone change, and a PUD approval. Um, some of these lots will um, be able to host some paired villas or twin villas. Those names are interchangeable. Approximately 20 of those paired villas or 12 to 13 single family. Um, those are not an absolute. That's the highest and, and most that could um, be held within those lots. Um, alternatives can be single family lots on those paired villa. Um, there is no uh, restriction that we're requesting any time. That would be the maximum. Some of the lots um, are designed um, topographically and, and based on their location within the existing street system would only be able to house a, a single family uh, style home. We have a, a trail system that we are partnering with a, a neighbor and family that owns that adjacent to this. Um, we have a recorded trail easement. Um, it would be open to the public. There would be access points um, on both 27th Street uh, through the development and then potentially farther south on 4th Avenue. We still have to look at some topography, some access adjacent to a detention pond, um, a right away fence and some landscaping improvements that were done as part of the last um, trail enhancement along the <laughs> 3 Excuse me. Um, as I mentioned before, there's some uh, single family homes and twin villas. This is going to be an HOA controlled neighborhood. It has specific guidelines. Um, there's a grassroots developed architecture. We talked a little bit about that on Planning Commission. That's basically designed that's reflective of the character in the neighborhood. These styles are unique to the city of Minot. They're not unique to other Midwestern communities. Um, the, the owners are targeting a 50 and over age group. Um, that doesn't restrict um, anyone um, younger than that. Um, but that's specifically the clientele and that, excuse me, that have reached out to, to the owners of this property and are looking for this style of housing. Um, there's a pocket or a privacy within within this area. This is considered an infill development. It's one of the last pieces along that 83 bypass that really has access from 27th Street. Um, a five-year Barden Golf Club membership will be um, given to the buyers and the builders of these homes. Um, that encourages some social connections that would likely happen during the, um, the building and, and living within those units, but this is just one more step that people can run right out on 4th Avenue out to the golf course and, and continue their um, neighborhood discussions or, or closeness. Uh, we want to remind the council that the density really fits in the R1 zoning. Um, right now this de the, the definition of the zoning ordinance for an R1 is established with the principal use of the land as single family. Um, the district has a low density of four to eight units per acre and some of the other uses permitted in this type of zoning um, without benefit of having an application in front of this body would be things as golf courses, schools, parks, and group homes, which certainly could increase the, the traffic of that neighborhood. But in our two family uh, district is established to develop a mixture of single and two family, broaden the choice of residential living styles in the city and to promote the quality development as we've shown you. Um, that comes straight from your ordinance, chapter R2. This district is also considered low. Um, the uses are similar um, with four to eight units per acre. I'm going to brief over the traffic impact a little bit. We've certainly talked about it. It was in the Planning Commission staff report. Um, the uh, traffic impact is quite low for this type of uh, development within an existing neighborhood. Um, the greatest peak hour impact would only add 34 vehicles to the ratio. Here's how we're working with the community. Um, 
the PUD submittal um, is, a, is a concrete in stone developer's agreement. This is what the developer plans on building. This is what the builders will bring in permits for. Um, it has an, a zoning designation of R1 and R2 uses underneath it. Um, the style of the architecture will be what's permitted. The size of the structures, the setbacks, those are the only things that are permitted. Um, the density will be included in this, this agreement. Um, the lot sizes fit with the R1 zoning. These are not small lots. Um, these are not obsessively large lots. These are lots that were developed at the time, 7,500 square feet and greater, um, what the neighborhood um, was proposing as an alternative back when this originally came in front of this body. Um, we want to maintain neighborhood communication throughout the process. Although it's in the backyards of many of the individuals that are here tonight, we certainly have looked at setting up emails and websites um, through whether it's through the NRV company itself or if it's through the realtor that's helping market um, these lots. We talked a little bit on Monday night about the concerns and, and those responses that, that we gave. Um, I won't repeat them here, but they really had to do with architecture or agriculture um, and the developed land. Um, we know that there are um, not in my backyard proponents that would like to keep things raw and, and um, this is an area that is developing, the infrastructure is in, and our clients would like to continue that. Um, the density, as I mentioned before, is, is within that allowance of the zoning district. Um, traffic concerns, I think we've addressed those. We've um, previously brought up a traffic engineer's report. Uh, we had that same engineer uh, amend that report um, and provide updated information um, to the planning department. And then finally, the tax revenue each year contributes to the city and the schools. We contacted the school district and looked at a number of schools in the area where these children, uh, if these families had children, might go. And the response was, we won't reject them, we won't send them somewhere. Our schools are um, at, at some point within a capacity number, but they have the availability to accept any more children because certainly the district is experiencing some out migration as well. And finally, the, what the neighborhood gains. We have these defined guardrails for what can and cannot be built. This is an, insur an insurance policy, per se. There are only single family and detached two family dwelling units. These will be owner occupied units, and in reality, one twin villa will have an owner on each side and just share a wall. A developer's agreement with the city and an HOA that further control the ultimate nature of the PUD will be provided. This is orderly development. Um, the individuals and the owners of these lots will sell these off um, individually and, and keep track of the process, the construction, all the way through from start to finish. They are local people. Uh, without the rezoning, could it create some problems seen in other developments? I think we saw that over the last five or six years uh, when lots are lotteried or, or sold off in chunks uh, and infrastructure is not in. Our infrastructure for this project is in, and so the lots, the smaller construction of uh, construction trucks and, and things like that will be limited to, to producing individual units within these blocks. Without the addition of the PUD, the, green like, the Greenway is unlikely to be developed. We surely consider this an asset to the neighborhood. The Parks District is in support of this. The Department of Transportation is in support of this. We've had these individual conversations. Um, we feel that it's a real asset, and we are partnered um, with those developers, and again, remind you that we have a recorded easement. That is the end of my presentation. I will have our, our um, representative, John Zimmerman, is in the audience with me as well tonight if you have any questions. Any questions for Mrs. By, Alderman Transfar? Thanks. Um, Ms. By, is the 2013 split, you said that's not an absolute. Um, what does that mean that that's not an absolute? If there's a lot that was identified in a previous slide on last Tuesday night as a PV or a paired villa, that is a, a lot that's large enough to support a two-family unit. If someone really loved that lot and wanted a single-family unit instead, we would sell that to them for, for that purpose. So at max, only 20 of those lots can support a double unit, where the remainders can support singles. Okay. Um, John is asking to speak to Mr. Zimmerman. I'll, I'll try to elaborate on that. Our, our goal there with 
with the PUD uh, uh, zoning and that being an available uh, ordinance in the toolbox now that didn't exist when the original owners had developed this pro uh, this project and when they looked at uh, when we stepped back once we you know had control of it uh, and ownership to try to figure out what would work in this market what are the tools that are available and the PUD is one of those tools and I think to further Donna's response there <clears throat> we don't know which lots gonna get sold first what you know would be built first there our intent is to go out and build a model of each type we have five different floor plans for both the split villa as we're calling them which is the detached in and five separate models uh, floor plans and models that we're developing again through grassroots architecture for the single family home so uh, we, we don't have a crystal ball that, on knowing what's going to come first we have had expressed interest in both products already um, so we'd hope there'd actually be some pre-sales to kickstart things but we are because everything's ready to go and we have a product we think that will be well received by the market even if it takes time to roll out since things aren't white hot right now on the real estate side of things um, we do have the patience and the perseverance to see it through but we're hoping that we would hit the ground running assuming we get the uh, the approval through the, the city council uh, to start building you know in short order into both types of product mr. Francois thank you um, maybe I misphrased my question my question is what what is stopping you then from is the 20 um, twin villas is that a maximum that you're bound by some way somehow meaning if you walk out of here with this approval just as it sits could you change that to 22 and 11 could you change that that 20 twin homes to 22 twin homes with nothing further from us I think I'll, I'll start with trying to answer the question and I'll defer to Donna as well. Our, our representation of that map was based on how we see things ultimately evolving. Our intent is to have single family along 27th to keep that consistency even though there's a fourplex, a legacy fourplex immediately across the street. And how that mix breaks out will be guarded, or I'm sorry, it will be uh, governed by the PUD uh, density rules and then ultimately how the market decides. Uh, for the demand between the two products. But as Donna mentioned, there's some lots that are conducive as proposed right now for only single family. So then the, the simple answer is no then? I mean, there's it's, nothing stopping you from doing that? Well, there's the, dens the, the max density uh, you know, ceiling, if you will, on that. How it evolves is gonna be a bit of a market-based situation there, Mr. Uh, Alderman Franz Fogg. Okay. okay. Alderman Hedberg. So, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, the, the maximum density you're saying would be 53 if you're 20 twin villas and 13 single families. Is, am I getting that right? Or yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And with the R1, we could technically go up to I believe 60 total units within the development as it is now. So from a unit count, it could actually be more. With the eight Schmano. units per with the eight units per acre, correct, Donna? You're excuse, excuse me. Go ahead. Total. Alderman Hedberg. One, one follow. So you're allowed, you're saying that you're allowed that density, but under the PUD, you would not be able to go beyond that 53? That'd be correct, yes. Alderman Hadbert. Alderman Schmetto. And I, did I understand Donna to say though that those 13 lots that you have kind of set aside for single family, they cannot support a twin, si or a twin home because of the size of them, I would guess. <coughs> Alderman Cimento, Mr. Mayor, and all, all the other council members, that is correct. The footprint itself, the layout of that lot, whether it's pie-shaped access, uh, width of garages, things like that, just doesn't justify the size that a twin villa would need to fit on that lot. Alderman Cimento. And then could you talk a little bit about, I know at that planning meeting, the road itself is a public road. I heard you say it's going to be maintained by the Homeowners Association. Could you talk a little bit about the home motion, how, like, how much are these people going to have to contribute monthly or annually? And God forbid, but what happens if this homeowners association doesn't make it? The city just steps in, or what's, what's going to happen? Mr. Mayor, Alderman Schmento, um, our intent obviously is until we hit critical mass with the HOA to essentially be the, the uh, ownership, if you will, of that and the management of that HOA until the neighborhood is sustained enough to take over it themselves. The situation where the HOA retained private, you know, ownership of the road, but it would be open to public access. We've already worked out uh, an agreement with the uh, Public Works Department regarding the lift station that's in place there, which only serves Northridge. We've also talked to uh, the city staff regarding uh, 
uh, you know, garbage and things of that nature. Uh, so that's not a unique thing in mind with respect to an HOA owning and maintaining that, <coughs> that road infrastructure. Um, and I apologize, what was the second part of your question? What happens if the homeowners association doesn't make it? Uh, I, you know, I can't. I mean, I, like I, I said, we'll, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I think that our feeling is is that we'll shepherd this through till it gets critical mass, and then it's you know, do sometimes those fail or not? Maybe they do. I mean, obviously there are a lot of active HOAs in mine it uh, already. Um, I couldn't make any predictions on how this one might turn out. Our hope is by having a superior, unique, unique product, you will have a HOA that not only becomes self-sustaining but obviously very, very active. I can't comment either on the monthly fees as they are now. So that, you know, that's something that's tough to predict. We have a framework that was originally built on the covenants for the architectural design, for the landscaping, uh, those sorts of details that will be converted into an HOA, but that obviously requires uh, legal work and other expenses that we wanna have some clarity on where we stand with respect to the zoning before we embark on that next step and create that clarity around the HOA and work with city staff to have an acceptable one put in place. Further questions, uh, Alderman Schuler. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Zimmerman, earlier, just a point of clarification, Donna had said that the uh, infrastructure is in place to include things like the streets, the lighting, maybe the storm sewers. Uh, has that all been bought and paid for? Is that something that will be special assessed to the residents of that neighborhood or anywhere else that further outlaying? Uh, no, the infrastructure, the sort of ready to build status of all the lots at Northbridge and including the uh, lift station, which will be dedicated to the city, um, has all been privately financed. There have been no assessments to the existing neighbors, uh, and the the costs obviously will be uh, as you know part of the uh, price, if you will, that people pay. But there'll be no specials. It's it's all, everything's in there for people uh, once the structures are built for them to move in. So all of the infrastructure has been paid for uh, privately, uh, and there will be no assessments uh, to any of the neighbors or to the the residents, short of say the HOA that was the ongoing. Uh, part of that process. Thank you. Alderman Edberg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, question on the trail system, would that be a similar situation with the trail system then? Where are you at with the trail system and, and uh, yeah. the cost? Yeah, uh, Mr. Mayor, Alderman Edberg. Uh, yeah, regarding the trail system, and that's obviously one of the conditions uh, to approval of the PUD, which is not uncommon relative to, I think there have been three PUDs that have come through. Uh, planning and city council that have been approved to date. Uh, our intent, and, and for example, one in particular to the north of uh, the, Hyatt, uh, the Hyatt House had an, uh, a, that condition attached for a small public area that includes a couple fire pits, I think, if I recall correctly, and some benches. And the requirement there was is that they put that in at the point they have 50% of the uh, you know, uh, structures occupied and such, if I recall correctly. In our case, what our intent is, is if we're successful in getting the rezoning and getting things going, as Donna mentioned, we already have a recorded trail easement in place. We have ongoing conversations uh, with the owner of the property. We've met with the park district and the DOT, and they're both in support of us actually, rather than doing a per lot dedication fee or something, and, and, and Mr. Merritt had indicated in our meeting with him, they don't have the budget right now <coughs> to start constructing that. What we would plan to do uh, is to you know, develop a thoughtful plan on a trail system that initially starts out similar surface-wise to the Woodland Trail to the south of the, uh, the river on the bypass uh, and work with city staff and obviously folks at Houston who are very versed in uh, trail building to lay out a thoughtful plan uh, through the end of this year and begin construction on that next year and not have, you know, any sort of uh, uh, condition, if you will, where we have to say, hey, we need to sell 50% of the, the properties in Northridge before we start doing this. Our intent is to have that in place become, obviously that becomes a, an, an amenity to people who are pitching for Northridge, but more broadly because it will be open to the public and ultimately ded dedicated to the park district, it becomes a neighborhood-wide uh, amenity and a connectivity point uh, to the trail system that doesn't exist right now. If you look at a broader map of Northwest Mina, you have a big pocket up there that really has no easy access to the existing trail system, and this would provide that. So our interest is aligned with the, the broader neighborhood interest uh, in getting the trail system in there sooner rather than later. Realistically, we'd like to look at next spring to start that and not attach it towards some sort of sales goal or something like that that's been attached to previous PUDs that have come through uh, the, uh, the Council and, and Planning Commission. Alderman Francois. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Zimmerman, you indicated that you're in preliminary negotiations about the green space with the, with the farming operation that owns it. Um, and that's a, that's a requirement prior to you doing any further work on this. Is that your understanding as well? I think the, con the condition is, 
uh, that we have a, an approved plan in place. And there, we've worked with the Park District, pardon me? Yeah, prior to the recording of the final plat, have a plan in place, whether it's a purchase, or we've talked to the Park District, there are other alternatives with respect to how the, the existing owner can work with uh, the Park District and us to have us develop that for them and have that ownership transfer in the way of the dedication directly from the current ownership to the, uh, the Park District at that point in time. Okay, so whether they dedicate it or you buy it from them, that will happen prior to you guys moving forward? Is that a fair statement? Okay. Yes. And then the other question I have, and, and it sounds like you'll know this, and if not, I know, I know Ms. Vi will. Um, the streets that you're putting in, are they, are they going to be up to city spec? Um, and if so, um, what stops you then from, at the first homeowners association meeting, they say, let's dedicate them to the city so that they can maintain them? Mr. Mayor? Alderman Francois, if you look closely at the plat, the street itself is a lot. It is a lot that then will be under the ownership included in the homeowners association, and each lot will then have a percentage of ownership to that. Um, the only historical reference I can make as, as the past city planner would be uh, of previous private roads having to come before the city council and ask them for the city to take over maintenance. So that would be the only avenue for that lot, no one has a street, to be able to come back for um, the services to be done by the city. The um, road is built to the city standards, it was built to spec, it has the right width, curb and gutter. Uh, it will have sidewalks as each individual uh, permit is pulled and completed. Okay, so do you think that will happen then? That the homeowner association will ask the city for them to take over? Um, Mr. Mayor, Alderman Francois, I do not. I do not believe, I believe that the Homeowners Association will be able to take care of the snow removal, patching, repair work, anything that would meet, need to be done underneath the ownership of those individuals in that neighborhood. Any other questions for Mrs. By? Alderman Lehner? Just, just one, based on the fact that the Homeowners Association <coughs> and the developers are going to take care of all of the maintenance of the streets and stuff, assuming we get 44 inches of snow in two weeks like we did last December, does your association have the wherewithal to handle, dispose of? I know until you get all the houses built, you can dump the snow there, but those are the things that I worry about is when you all of a sudden can't do it and you say, hey, city, help us out. Mr. Mayor, uh, Alderman Lehner, uh, since we'll be, uh, the, our development group will be essentially the shepherds of the HOA for the foreseeable future uh, and the need to make sure that we're performing on the requirements of the HOA, whether it's snow removal, um, other maintenance issues and such, I can assure you that we do not want to have any sort of uh, rumor otherwise going around that we're not able or unwilling to maintain that street to the standards those neighbors would expect, not only living there, but the adjo adjoining neighbors as well. I think there was a question raised at one of our three neighborhood meetings on why it wasn't plowed this winter and why we allowed the city to plow up uh, and block the entrance into the uh, the development. And quite frankly, uh, with having no residents down there this winter, uh, nothing happening, uh, it didn't make any sense for us to go in there and even clear that out and create that access. Although in the nicer uh, times of the year that we have uh, fully allowed the neighbors to access and they use it for walking and walking their dogs and we see strollers down there quite often and such and we've tried to at least make that accessible as an extra walking area even though it is uh, you know private property but trying to still make that accessible right now. Further questions? Alderman Sipma. Thank you Mr. Mayor. Come, uh, the question I have the question I have is for the public access. Taking a look I see one access point here uh, what looks between a couple of lots but then up on the street is there any concern about um, traffic coming down to that area and parking <coughs> and, and congestion and things like that to access any of these trails? Well I, I think that there you know it's residential parking up there I mean I think that if you look at the Woodland Trail there's a small parking lot that's there but uh, I think that the way that it sets up it's intended for uh, the, the, the trail to be for the residents. I mean, there's not a, a lot of parking there and such, and if some people want to use that as a starting off point, you know, to the extent there's parking available, they can do that. But we look at it as more of a connection point and one that opens up the neighborhood on the 27th Street access point. There will be an access point to the existing parallel 
uh, uh, trail along the 83 bypass, which we discussed with the NBDOT. Uh, we'll have an access point out of the neighborhood itself, which gets back to the earlier question regarding getting the trail in place sooner rather than later as an amenity for the folks we're targeting uh, and marketing to on the, the, the development itself. And then there's the potential, it's a separate tract of property, but owned by the same uh, owners that could potentially connect to Fourth Avenue down below as well and create sort of a parallel uh, nature-centric trail versus the cement pavement trail or the, uh, the, the uh, asphalt trail that follows along the bypass. That's a separate element, what we talked about today and what we have the easement on is that entire north 17 acres, which will comprise three different connectivity points in the neighborhood on 27th Street and then <coughs> along the bypass uh, to connect to the existing trail. Uh, just for argument's sake, with the street owned by the individuals, for argument's sake, if somebody did come down there and park to access those trails, would they have that? Would they have the right to park on a city street that's not owned by the city? Uh, I, at this time, I don't. Uh, we don't envision extra parking restrictions down there outside of what you'd normally see. You know, you can't double park and things like that. But uh, um, at this point in time, we don't have any anything specific related to that. So that would be something that if we had, you know, there's going to be a limited amount of parking. Obviously, we've got all the adequate off-street parking for the proposed uh, units and such. But at this, uh, I don't have a, you know, a, a concise answer. If there was a, to be a restriction, I'm not sure if we'd have to work with the city attorney's office on that as a private street, uh, privately owned street, but with public access. Our intent would be likely to keep that, you know, as open as is feasible with respect to the available parking spaces. <coughs> Further questions, Alderman Laner? Just one more and then I'm done. I assume that you checked with our fire department and one of those big fire trucks can get down those cul-de-sacs to make a U-turn if they need to in case of emergency. Mayor Barney, uh, uh, Alderman Laner, yes. As Donna mentioned, not only are the streets to, to city spec, uh, the turnarounds at both ends of the cul-de-sac are, are large enough and have been approved by the fire department to accommodate necessary turnaround space. Other questions for Mr. Zimmerman? Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Further discussion from the council? Anyone else in the audience before we get to the council? Anybody else? Council? Mr. Alderman Pankow. Yeah, I have a question for the city engineer. Uh, city engineer? Mr. Meyer? Mr. Pankow? Um, Mr. Mayor, as uh, we know, the second phase of the four lane of the bypass <coughs> going from 4th Avenue North uh, next year. Uh, what is the plans in the future? Is, a, is the 13th Avenue something that hasn't even been, look, been looked at with the four lane of that and closing that off is that something 10 to 15 years down the road? Um, has that been orchestrated in those plans yet? Mr. Mayor and Alderman Panko, just for clarification, the, the second phase of the bypass improvements from 4th Avenue up to the US 83, they're, they're not in the works right now. They're held off indefinitely until um, the state can uh, have the funding sources to move forward. That said, <clears throat> a couple years ago we did look at that intersection 19th Avenue and the bypass with the DOT. We had several different options we could look at. The one that essentially came to the top would be leaving it full access, which means adding right and left turn lanes like you'll see on other intersections on the four-lane bypass. With the caveat that in the future, if an interchange is built at 21st Avenue, 19th Avenue is just too close, and we probably have to restrict that, either closing completely or make it right in and right out. And then that would then trigger the necessity for improving Sunset Boulevard to have kind of a backage road up to 21st Avenue to get on the interchange. If <coughs> development hasn't already occurred, to improve Sunset Boulevard. So there's a lot of things that are in play there right now that I can't, uh, can't answer. Uh, if you were to, Mr. Mayor, um, if you were to give an estimate of timeline, would you say it's at least five years out, if not better, um, those plans? Um, Mr. Mayor and Alderman Panko, I, I think it's gonna depend on two things. Uh, number one, the, the traffic level. So that's what triggered us the first go around with the bypass is we, we got enough truck traffic on the bypass for the DOT to take a serious look at, at four-laning that. Now that's quite a down sum. 
um, but we all know that can certainly tick back up at any point. The other thing, of course, is, is uh, funding the rest of those improvements. So it's probably going to be another 10 to $15 million to take you all the way up to the bypass. Um, with the DOT's budget as it is right now, I would say it's going to be at least probably another biennium or two before they're in a position to fund those improvements. Further discussion? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're welcome. Further discussion? And the motion on the floor is to approve. Mr. Mayor. Alderman Hedberg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I feel somewhat compelled here. I guess it's in my ward here, and I've heard from several of the, the folks, uh, obviously, uh, some of them here tonight. Um, I want to commend Mr. Zimmerman for uh, being open and, and transparent, and, and I did attend one of the open houses that uh, he had that, at, um, at the site, um, and it was very helpful. I think uh, neighbors had a lot of questions and still do. I think it's probably too bad that this development was uh, allowed to proceed in the first place, but uh, Mr. Zimmerman, I don't think, was involved in the, the initial development. Uh, it was a coulee. They put a lot of money into it, and I think now it's a situation where they're having trouble getting getting money back out of it and, and paying, paying for the... Uh, development in, in the first place. Um, so we're, we're stuck with this and, and uh, um, I think the neighbors are, are concerned about, uh, um, I think this started off as a 60 plus unit um, development. Um, the neighbors uh, worked with it and the planning commission I think approved uh, the 33 lots or 34 lots uh, um, and, and the neighbors were somewhat comfortable with that. Um, now we're looking at moving to, to 53 units, probably maximum, and, and uh, I think there's just a concern that uh, is, is that the limit? Is that where we're gonna end up at? And, and uh, um, some, some questions there. So I share some of those concerns with the, with the neighbors and uh, just wanted to bring those forward. Any other discussion? Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry, where? Alderman Sitma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wanna convey some of those thoughts as well. I think my reference comes over to Northeast Minot within some of the development areas over there where there is limited access in and out in um, up in the area of the New Country Club and in that region where we take a look at an increased number of units. I, I like the designs, I like the the, the greenway and, and so many other aspects of this, but it just comes down to I think that single single unit family dwellings uh, would, would fit so much better here in the scope of just traffic and safety, in my opinion. Um, and as Mr. Hedberg had said, I think there's been a, a tremendous amount of money that has been invested into this. And don't get me wrong, I would love to see this area developed with a good greenway and, and some very community-minded um, housing pieces in there, but it just comes down to that limited traffic to me, uh, or access with an increased amount of traffic. Anybody else? No, I live in that area also, and uh, I drove down there the other day, and um, I, I personally think it would be an asset to that area. I think the access to the, uh, the walking path is everything that we've been talking about for neighborhoods in our community. Um, I think that it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a quality development. It's not going to be like some of the other ones that we've had that sprung up after the, uh, the flood. But um, I understand the concerns of the neighbors, but um, I, I think it would be I think it would be an asset. If there isn't uh, Alderman Pankow, then we'll go to the vote. Yeah, I I hear the concerns of Alderman uh, Hedberg, um, and the comments of the developers to truly have a developers agreement lock these very specific items that we've talked about into an agreement with the city and I think that would be vital if that is adhered to and agreed to with the city that I think that the PUD was created for enhancing uh, residential areas and connecting them to viable walking trails and, and parks and greenways. Um, so uh, I think if we can lock it up in, in the developer agreement, uh, I, I look at it as a, a good idea. Other been uh, with us. Okay, just for clarification on my part, we're talking about number one, right, on the planning commission. Right. Okay, that to me just has something to do with being 
changing the name from Northland Village Edition to Block One to Northland Village North Ridge Villas Edition Two or Second Edition. Number two is the one that has to deal with the zoning, right? Well, we're going to be addressing both of them okay. tonight, so right. uh, I didn't limit the discussion to okay. because it's a broad topic. All right, I just want to make sure that, because I think Ms. Bosn is was addressing number two and not one. But so. we okay. I'll let me straight. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess I I recall the most recent uh, fire, the relocation of a new fire station in Northwest Minot, and I think about the residents there and what uh, I can feel there and hear their emotion of wanting it to remain the same. I too, I, I think about these areas that if this doesn't happen, what's next? And if we keep uh, the initial zoning, uh, maybe something comes along that's less desirable. And so I'm, I'm curious, maybe it's just a question, maybe it's too late, but if we're talking about covenants, isn't there a way that we can find some compromise instead of having 50 or 60, can't we talk about a covenant so that can we, we can some, find some compromise in terms of the number of structures that could be built there? I know that's a difficult challenge for Mr. Zimmerman and probably for investors into something like this, but it's just a question. Mrs. By, could you come forward, please? I have a question based on what you uh, stated in your presentation. In your presentation, did you say that the the density that you're proposing with this development is still within the R1 density guidelines? Mr. Mayor and Alderman, yes it is. Okay. But it's based on the total square footage of all the lots. We are not asking for an increased density. Um, the lot numbers, the replat, as, as you just indicated, item number one would stay the same. The structures in reality would remain 34 because those twin villas are attached. So you wouldn't see additional structures, you would just see a larger structure that has two units within it. Thank you. Any questions for Mrs. Bai? Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Further discussion? Let's call the roll on item one. Olson? Yes. Panko? Yes. Pajagula? No. Schuler? Yes. Cimento? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Street? Yes. Withis? Yes. Berg? Yes. Bransfog? No. Hedberg? No. Janser? Yes. Poson? No. Lehner? Yes. Motion passes. Motion passes. That takes us to item number two, changing the zone from R1. Move to. Move second. Who moved it? I'm sorry. Francois, who seconded? Laner. Discussion? Mayor. Alderman Jansen. I'd like to ask for uh, a clarification from somebody from the planning department, maybe, about this um, trail dedication, the, you know, the, the easement for a trail, but not actually having the land dedicated that the trail is going to be on. And is that practical? terms of, you know, okay, so people can walk Mr. on Davis, the trail, Mr. but they can't go off the sure. trail. I mean, what, what is that all? Oh. And I guess, bottom line, does that, does that satisfy what is required by the PUD zone? Uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, Mr. Janser, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the, to be part of the PUD, rezoning the the Peterson land should be included uh, as part of the application um, it, and it was not so as part of the condition for the rezoning uh, we are asking that the uh, Peterson owners sign on to that uh, application and and at least uh, give uh, the, the uh, uh, applicant uh, permission to include that as part of his rezoning um, so that would be a condition that would be asked for prior to the second reading. Um, and I, my understanding is that the uh, developer has asked for time between now and then to, to make those arrangements. The, the other condition would be uh, to have the park district enter into an agreement with the uh, developer 
in terms of the construction and maintenance of, of the uh, of the greenway. So, okay, so if I hear, understand you correctly, what you're saying is those, those things don't exist tonight. And, Correct. And, and, and they are necessary for this project to meet the PUD qualification. Correct. And so then, um, so if, if, obviously if, if they get completed by the second reading, um, then it's satisfied. If they don't get completed by the second reading, then where are we at? Then, then the application, what happens? We would have to delay the application until that, that agreement took, took effect or took place. Okay, so I, I guess then I'm wondering, you know, why um, this wasn't held in planning until that got resolved. Well, I believe the feeling was to get the project moving forward. It, it had been delayed or it hesitate, in hesitation for years, and, uh, and the developer really wanted to move it forward. We, we did uh, have discussions with the developer about that, and uh, they expressed to us that the negotiations were in the works, that the park, the park district was in agreement. So we, we felt as a compromise it was um, just a way to keep the project moving forward. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions for Mr. Davis? Ms. Bai, do you have something to add to this? I did, Mr. Mayor. If, if I could expand a little bit to Alderman Janser's question. Um, the partnership between Northridge Villas and the Thompson-Peterson farmland or trailway area has been in place for a number of years. Um, the, that family has not wavered in their agreement uh, to provide this opportunity, although it is certainly true that Mr. Zimmerman and his partnership do not own the land at this time, but it is coming together as a partnership, and, and that's the plan of the, the project moving forward. In the event something would happen, we certainly wanted to find alternatives with the Park District, and so we had a conversation with them just a few weeks ago. There's alternatives to that prior to the second reading for some reason. Um, Mr. Mr. Thompson has, er, has not been able to meet with us in person. He has been out of state for quite some time. Um, we have a number of, of uh, conversations with him over the past couple of years, specifically my clients. The Park District could accept payment in lieu of. Um, the uh, Northridge Villas uh, organization, LLC, could write a check for the amount owed uh, as part of the public land dedication fee. Um, another alternative would be that each of these lots are assessed through that public fee, and as someone pulls a permit for that first, second, 16th home, the fees are attached to the building permit and collected at that time. Um, and thirdly, um, an area of one of those lots um, could be dedicated similar to a past PUD, and a lot could have a small barbecue, um, a gazebo, a fire pit, a picnic table, uh, a bench, um, and it could be near uh, the access to one of the trail systems. So there certainly are alternatives. Um, we are pre presenting uh, the most beneficial and the what we think is the highest and best opportunity for this neighborhood to develop. Um, and it's certainly something that, that we intend to um, find solidified uh, before the second reading. Are there questions for Mrs. By? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Further discussion on the issue? Anybody else care to comment? Seeing no one, call the roll. Francois? No. Hedberg? No. Janser? No. Cosen? No. Lehner? Yes. Olson? Yes. Panko? Yes. Padragula? No. Schuler? Yes. Cimento? Yes. Sitma? No. Strait? Yes. With us? No. Berg? Yes. Barney? Yes. Uh, that concludes the report of the Planning Commission. Uh, item number nine is
consider the report of the Finance and Improvements Committee. Alderman Francois. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, we have 14 items on our agenda. Item 9 has been um, amended, and the amendment is on your desk. And the only amendment is that um, there's a couple of houses added to that list. And with that, with that addendum, I would move consent agenda on all 14 items. Second. Second. Seconded by Pankow. Discussion again for those of you in the audience. This means that all of these items will be passed as they came out of committee. If there is something on here you would like to discuss or to, excuse me, uh, look at uh, um, pulling for consideration, let me know and I'll pull it. Seeing no one, um, call the roll. Francois? Yes. Hedberg? Yes. Janser? Yes. Cosen? Yes. Laner? Yes. Olson? Yes. Panko? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Schuler? Yes. Shimento? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Strait? Yes. With us? Yes. Berg? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That completes the report. Thank you, sir. Item number 10 is consider the report of the Public Works and Safety Committee. Um, who is that? Schuler. There you are. Wait. Thank Alderman you, Schuler. We had 10 items on our on our uh, on our agenda, and I would move consent on all 10. Second. Who seconded? Chancer. Again, for those of you in the audience, all 10 of these items will be passed as they came out of committee. Unless you wish to have one of these items pulled, let me know. Otherwise, they'll go through as they did in committee. Seeing no one, um, call the roll. Schuler? Yes. Shimento? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Strait? Yes. Withers? Yes. Berg? Yes. Franzfeld? Yes. Hedberg? Yes. Janser? Yes. Cosen? Yes. Laner? Yes. Olson? Yes. Panko? Yes. Padrigula? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Alderman Schuler. Item number 11 is consider the report of the airport committee. Alderman Olson. Mr. Mayor, we had 11 items on our agenda. Item number three does have an amendment that is on everyone's desk. Um, with that amendment, I would move approval on all 11 items. Second. Seconded by Lehner. Uh, discussion. Once again, all these items from the airport committee will be passed as they came out of committee, unless you indicate otherwise. No one? Call the roll. Olson? Yes. Panko? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Schuler? Yes. Shimento? Yes. Sipma? Yes. Strait? Yes. With us? Yes. Berg? Yes. Francois? Yes. Hedberg? Yes. Janser? Yes. Cosen? Yes. Laner? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That concludes my report. Thank you. Item number 12 is consider the report of the Liquor Gambling Control Committee, Alderman Hedberg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we had uh, four items on our agenda. I would move consent on all four items. We pull two. Seconded by Berg. Pull two. Pull two. Who pulled that? So, okay. uh, item number one, then. Um, I'm sorry. One, three, and four approved uh, and consent. Anybody else would care to have anything else pulled? Call the roll. Hedberg? Yes. Janser? Yes. Colson? Yes. Laner? Yes. Olson? Yes. Panko? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Schuler? Yes. Shimento? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Strait? Yes. With us? Yes. Berg? Yes. Francois? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, Alderman Hedberg? Number two is a request to transfer the retail liquor and beer license from Arnie's Incorporated to Sheila Gehring, subject to the recipient of all documentation and fee and approval by. Chief of Police, Building Official, and Fire Marshal. I'll move that item. Second. Seconded by Withers. Alderman Sitma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just looking for some information, possibly from the city clerk, on the uh, requirement that the uh, Finance Committee, or I'm sorry, the Alcohol and Liquor Committee had uh, put on the transferring that was a documented amount attached to that transfer. Alderman Sitma and the City Council haven't received that as of yet. They did say that they were closing on June 14th or 15th, and until then they did not have um, the payment amount. Okay. Could we include that when it does become available in the next report? Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Any 
any further discussion? <coughs> discussion. Call the roll. Hedberg? Yes. Janser? Yes. Colson? Yes. Lehner? Yes. Olson? Yes. Panko? Yes. Podjagula? Yes. Schuler? No. Cemento? Yes. Sigma? Yes. Straight? Yes. Withis? Yes. Berg? Yes. Francois? Yes. Motion carries. That concludes my report. Thank you, Alderman Hedberg. Uh, item number 13, uh, there's two items. Consider the report of the Magic Fund Screening Committee. I would like to note before you make a motion that there's a typographical error on item number one. The dollar amount should reflect 43700 So make that note, please, in your motion. Is there a motion? Mr. Mayor, I'll move both those items with the stipulation that the amount in item number one is $43,700. Second. Seconded by someone. Olson, discussion? Discussion? Call the roll. Janser? Yes. Tosin? Yes. Lehner? Yes. Olson? Yes. Panko? Yes. Padrigula? Yes. Schuler? Yes. Schmento? Yes. Sigma? Yes. Straight? Yes. Withis? Yes. Berg? Yes. Francois? Yes. Hedberg? Yes. Motion passes. Uh, item number 14 is consider the report of the Special Assessment Commission. Move 14. Second. Seconded by Lucas. Moved by Francois. Discussion? Discussion? Anybody in the audience care to address this? Discussion? Call the roll. Francois? Yes. Hedberg? Yes. Janser? Yes. Posen? Yes. Lehner? Yes. Olson? Yes. Panko? Yes. Padrigula? Yes. Schuler? Yes. Shimento? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Straight? Yes. Withis? Yes. Burton? Yes. Motion passes. Item number 15 is other business. Let's, let's take these one at a time. Number one is appoint a candidacy board. Do you have the information in front of you? Have a motion? Move it. Seconded by Olson. Seconded by who? Straight. Straight. Um, discussion? Discussion? Call the roll. Olson? Yes. Panko? Yes. Padrigula? Yes. Schuler? Yes. Cemento? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Straight? Yes. Withis? Yes. Berg? Yes. Francois? Yes. Hedberg? Yes. Janser? Yes. Colson? Yes. Lehner? Yes. Motion passes. Item number two, revised meeting schedule. Do you have a motion? So moved by who? Lehner. Seconded by Shimano. Any discussion? Pardon me? Do we have you it? You don't have it yet? Okay, that's why you wanted to show it. All right, go ahead. Sorry, I misunderstood. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Just wanted to go through something very quickly for you. Uh, the current meeting schedule that was developed during the uh, governance committee change uh, showed that we were to hold committee the whole meetings on, uh, I believe, first and third or second and third um, uh, alternating weeks. The staff have looked at this and found the meeting schedules to be in conflict with keeping orderly business of the city and potentially compromising our ability <coughs> on the bidding process. So what we would like to recommend is uh, keeping the committee of the holes uh, meetings, uh, but just moving them to, for the interim period, the dates that are on your screen here, essentially um, the June, adding the June 28th uh, meeting date, uh, the, and let me, the June, July 11th, July, <coughs> excuse me, the meeting dates and times um, that we would like to move to uh, and occur on this particular schedule here, which has been placed in front of you. Uh, what we would like to do is essentially have these meetings occur on the Tuesday and the Wednesday as they have as committees currently, uh, the week prior to the city council meeting, and have the committee of the whole, which is essentially the entire city council, meet on that same schedule and then um, conduct our business that way. So it's essentially taking and making more operationally functional the meetings to coincide on the uh, from a date standpoint in regard to the way the city currently conducts its business, but still keeping them as committee of the whole meetings. So uh, with that, I'll entertain any questions you might have. 
Any questions for Mr. Berry? Any questions? So there is a resolution, Mr. Mayor, that's been included. Uh, that resolution simply just modifies the um, meeting dates to the dates that uh, we are making the suggestion to. So with your approval, we can modify those dates accordingly, and then we'll get those uh, out to you as reminders. Is, uh, who made the motion? I did. Are you okay with that? I'm fine. In the second? Okay, he's nodding his head. I can hear it. Um, discussion? Further discussion? Alderman Olson? I guess just for clarification, so you've only scheduled through August, but the dates, they'll basically coincide with this. They'll, they'll be similar to what finance and, and public works had been. So going forward, I mean, you really could finish out the 2017 calendar with ease if this were accepted. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Alderman Olson, just for the next three months until the new city council decides what it wants to do going forward. Okay. We would still make that recommendation going forward, but this is just to deal with the resolution that uh, contemplated this, this interim period of time until the new city council could make whatever decisions it wanted to to go forward long term. All right, thank you. Alderman Franz Bach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, what on the creation of the agenda under 2A, it says that any item may be placed on the agenda by the mayor or council member, but there's no there's no time. Um, it says, is it prior, is that under B where it says no later than the time prior to any committee of the whole meeting? Is that the meeting before? Um, I don't have the language in front of me. If I could defer to the city clerk at the moment. Um. So Alderman Franz Fogg and City Council, it would work similarly to how it does now. Um, I kind of create due dates on a monthly basis and send all of the department heads a notice when they're due. So yeah, this would just be any time prior to <coughs> the committee of the whole meeting as we designate and we do them monthly is how we designate it now. Mr. Mayor. Alderman Lanner. As it stands now, don't don't we, before it goes on a committee agenda, does it need 10 days notice before it goes on the agenda? I suggest if that were the case now, that should maybe be the case going forward. Did you get your question answered, Alderman Francois? Well, Mr. thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, if this is the resolution you're passing, or we're passing, and it doesn't talk about dates, um, I'm just saying, I'm just wondering, it says any item may be placed upon the agenda, but there's no date or time. So the day before, which we wouldn't like, nobody would like that, the day before I walk in as a council member and say I want something on the agenda, this says I can do it. Um, I think it needs to be modified somehow. So, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Uh, thank you, Alderman Franz Fogg. The only thing that we are suggesting as modification of the resolution that you have before you are the meeting dates. Everything in the resolution that exists today has been already approved by the City Council. So we're not, ch we're not proposing any changes whatsoever to the resolution or the language. It is what was already approved. We're merely asking for a change of those number of dates for the realigning the committee of the whole meetings. Hopefully that helps. Further discussion? Further discussion? Other roll? Lehner? Yes. Olson? Yes. Panko? Yes. Padrabula? Yes. Schuler? Yes. Cimento? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Straight? Yes. With us? Yes. Berg? Yes. Francois? Yes. Hedberg? Yes. Janser? Yes. Cosin? Yes. Item number three, NDR gathering space. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, members of the City Council. I wanted to uh, take just a few moments of your time this evening to uh, talk with you about the uh, National Disaster Resilience uh, Gathering Space. I mentioned it earlier um, in my presentation, but held off on the details until I could give you this particular uh, short presentation. Uh, it came to me as a bit of a surprise during the candidate forum that the Minot Delhi held that every council member or candidate, I should say, every council candidate that was asked to respond on the location of the gathering space was uh, not in favor of one of the sites we identified, which is the Trinity parking lot across from Pizza Planet. 
Uh, so I wanted to share with you the thinking that went into that, not to convince you, uh, because again, this is one site of um, uh, many that we've looked at. Uh, it is a promising site, and I wanted to just give you some insights as to why it's so promising, and then you can make a more informed uh, decision uh, potentially regarding whether or not it's a site we should continue to vet out moving forward. So with that, let me just touch base on what it was we promised the federal government and the community in regards to a gathering space. The purpose of the space was to create a recreational entertainment facility that would allow us to have festivals and a variety of other public events and improve the resiliency of our downtown as well as revitalize our downtown area. The funding that was set aside for this particular project in the NDR program was six million dollars and that funding expires on September 30th, 2022. So we're dealing with a limited budget and a limited time frame. The vision that we had, uh, that we supplied or we applied to for, for the funding was that we would have this gateway park. It was a destination park that would be downtown. It was gonna be used year round, so it would have to include year round facilities and it would have to be two acres in size. And we guaranteed that to HUD we would build a two acre park um, and so that is another stipulation that we must follow through on. The amenities included a number of different things and these amen this amenity list was developed by a number of community engagement opportunities. <laughs> things like walking paths, band shell, a playground, opportunities for farmers market, uh, green space, fountain, heritage and cultural attributes that would be spread throughout the facility. Uh, some of the important considerations that we need to keep in mind is, again, as I mentioned, it has to be a two-acre site, has to be within the city limits, <coughs> site needs to be centrally located, accessible, and highly visible. These are all things that we said we would do in the HUD application. Um, the cost to acquire the property, any cost to relocate any businesses that we might acquire, any cost to demolish or clear the land, construct the facility, all needs to be reasonable and practical and it needs to be within the $6 million limit. So as you might imagine, the more we spend on encumbered sites, that means sites that have buildings on it, the, more, the less we have available to spend on developing the actual improvements. So we're looking for uh, spaces that meet this criteria. Otherwise, that $6 million budget that we have quickly gets uh, consumed by buying buildings or buying developed lots, um, doing the assessments on those, relocating businesses, reestablishing businesses, de demolishing those buildings if they can't be used or if we need to demolish them otherwise, um, and then scraping the property and then finally being able to build what it is we'd like to build. So of course a parking lot comes with very minimal costs as it relates to uh, all of those um, activities that I just mentioned. So I wanted to share with you, and once again we have um, some problems with the display. Um, this red box that's in the center of your screen should border essentially um, about the, the north end of the railroad tracks uh, on the north side, Burdick Expressway on the south side, um, just a little bit further to the east of 3rd Street, and then of course Broadway. And it is to denote the area essentially that we looked at on a parcel by parcel and block by block basis. Uh, the criteria as I mentioned are sitting here on the lower left of your screen uh, that we used to go through and identify each of these blocks. When we do that, what we essentially see is that the blocks that don't work are X'd out because of the encumbrances, because of all of the other criteria that were identified. We have two lots essentially that do work for us as a, as a first pass, if you will. The Trinity parking lot is the one on the green, uh, the green lot on the, on the left side of the aerial photograph. And then there's a lot that looks smaller, unfortunately, because we're having graphical display problems here with the, with the podium. But uh, it says number 13, and it's kind of into the north and to the right side of the screen. That's actually a little bit bigger. It's about two acres. Uh, plus or minus uh, on that particular parcel. Those are two parcels that uh, we're looking at. The parcel on the east side 
is one that uh, is very questionable for us at the moment because it is in the industrial area, would require some site assessments and some evaluation as to whether or not there's industrial contamination. Uh, we, don't, we don't know if that is or how much if there is. Um, so uh, there need to be more investigation on that particular site. At the moment, our conversations with Trinity Health um, have been just that, conversations. There's no negotiation, and I want to make that very clear. All we're doing in our conversations right now is at a high level trying to identify viable properties. That's it. There's no decisions that have been made. There's no representations of decisions or any of that kind. So I want to make very clear that all we're doing right now is a simple siting exercise. And when we do this, we come up with very limited options if we want to keep this facility located in and around the central business district downtown. So that being said, uh, when we went to talk to Trinity about the possibilities, what we were first interested in hearing from Trinity, the Trinity board, was if their site was possible or not. If they had no interest at all, then we would continue to move on. Uh, they have been very clear to me that they are wanting to be partners with the city and they want to leave a positive legacy downtown. And so they've been very interested and excited in entertaining this possibility with the caveat that they, they're not speaking as if it's done. They've still got to do their due diligence on their side. There's a lot of details that need to be worked out. But they had asked me to come make a presentation to their board to talk about what exactly we were thinking. Uh, and I gave that presentation. Uh, and it was favorably considered. Uh, I wanted to give you essentially the same presentation with some revised drawings because the interest has grown uh, at that level and we thought we would provide maybe a little bit more detail as to what the possibilities are of the site, keeping in mind that what you're about to see are simply sketches of concept. They are not plans or, or whatnot. Uh, this is what the Trinity parking lot looks like. Uh, ironically enough, it's 1.9 acres in size. We need two acres. We think we can get to the two, and we think that's probably within the, the fudge factor, if you will, but uh, we do believe that we can get to two acres, and I'll show you how in just a moment. The parking lot essentially has 206 spaces on it. Uh, it has prime frontage on Broadway, and of course we believe that its highest and best use is not a parking lot, it's something else. Uh, potentially a park, potentially a building, whatever. But let's just look at the possibilities of the site. This is a concept drawing that's been revised to reflect all of the components that we told HUD and this community we would incorporate into a gathering space located somewhere in the downtown area. Um, it, is, it is a drawing that's been developed internally. This is by our planning department staff, and I want to thank them for taking the time to draw this up. We didn't send it out to an architect. Uh, and it is to consider just a concept. When we add all the various components that this particular park includes, you can see uh, it's a pretty exciting opportunity. And it's likely not going to look like this. Uh, it may not even be on this location, but these are the types of amenities that this particular facility has to include. Um, just to point out a couple concepts, there's an amphitheater uh, separately located in the lower right. Uh, there's a gazebo in the center, a heritage fountain, uh, there's walking paths all throughout, a grassy knoll um, that has uh, flagpoles and other sorts of historic characteristics on it. Uh, it's got um, a number of different walking paths and passive use uh, facilities. It's been identified in this location, if it were to be sited in this location, to have grand archways that bring people from Broadway onto 2nd Avenue Southwest and also onto 3rd Avenue Southwest. And I'll show you a rendering of that. That's what these archways at the top and the bottom of the screen look, look like. Um, that invite people into our downtown to help create connections between the park and our center of commerce. On the e very east side, where 1st Street Southwest is, what we would conceived is matching up this particular opportunity with one of our master plan ideas, and that is a bus terminal. Right now our bus terminal, where we onload and offload folks to exchange bus routes, is up here at the auditorium. Uh, it could be located in a downtown facility. If we were to close down First Street Southwest and bump the park out, park parcel out, 
about 20 to 30 feet, we can pick up enough real estate to get our two acres and also put in a, tr a transit facility there where people could come to downtown, get off the bus, visit a while, get on the bus and go back or take a transfer or whatnot. There are lots of possibilities with this particular site, which is why the staff and I are pretty excited about, again, keeping in mind it is just a concept. Everything here is conceptual. The parking garage is located immediately across 1st Street Southwest afford 300 spaces that people could park at uh, and where we could have other facilities and have some connection there as well. So we feel like there's kind of an interesting uh, opportunity here, particularly when you consider that most of the other sites in our central business district are uh, highly limited. Now, this is a rendering looking at this archway. Again, this isn't how it would be designed, it's just a concept. Uh, at the intersection, uh, the north uh, west corner of the uh, site, looking to the southeast, so at the corner of Broadway and Second. Uh, and you can see there's, uh, in this drawing, a wall that's a modified height with some iron fencing, uh, wrought iron that goes around the Broadway side. There's been some concerns about safety, right? There's, there's a number of ways to address the safety issues. Keep in mind this is a passive use park, um, but uh, to keep children and to keep balls and other sorts of things uh, out of Broadway and other streets, there's a number of ways this thing could be designed to, to minimize and mitigate that. Uh, this wouldn't be the first park located in a downtown facility that, uh, that uh, wouldn't have to address those types of issues. Um, looking at another rendering here, this is looking at the opposite corner looking northwest from the south uh, east and there's your bus terminal kind of on the right uh, and then the park as it's seen towards the northwest. The idea with this, um, with the, a park like this is to have large sidewalks that you could put a number of street vendors or you could put a, um, a series of uh, farmers market stands along the edges of this so you have nice wide uh, patio type sidewalks uh, you'd have screening, you'd have fencing, you'd have all sorts of things. And the idea is that those kinds of amenities cost a lot of money. And that's why we feel like if we can take the $6 million and maximize the majority of those funds to go into building improvements as opposed to demoling, demolitioning or uh, demolishing buildings and uh, clearing sites and relocating businesses and all of that stuff, there's an opportunity for us to maximize the amenities of the park. Again, it doesn't need to be in this location, but I wanted to give you the thinking behind why this rose to the top pretty quickly in its evaluation. Here's another uh, concept of a fence, um, maybe a little more industrial uh, than uh, maybe we might otherwise might want to see. But there are a, a number of options, just demonstrating the options uh, for safety and other improvements. So I wanted to give you the, um, some of the additional information about this site. Again, not to convince you that it's the right site, but to just help you understand why it's one of the sites that we continue to vet out and work with Trinity uh, Health uh, in, in continuing to discuss. So with that, I'll take any questions you might have and stop there. Mr. Berry, this was informational and that actionable, right? That is absolutely correct. Okay, thank you. Um, <coughs> Alderman Schuller. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Berry, I want to thank you for um, this presentation. Uh, I have to say, initially, the mom and me came out, and I was really concerned as well for safety issues. Um, after having a conversation with some downtown business people, and, and maybe getting a better idea of what can be there, uh, I started to think a little bit more about it, especially over the past week, and realized that we have a park several blocks to the south in the Scandinavian Heritage Center that serves a similar purpose that does not have a wall. And I do think this is a good location for this for a few reasons. I know there's been considerations for down by the railroad um, tracks as well. There's some safety issues there, but not only that, when the new map changes come through for flood uh, protection and flood insurance, any structures that would be built down there would be impacted by that as well. So going forward after thinking about this for the past two weeks, I, I support this location um, because of some concepts that were brought forth to me and, and, uh, and your presentation and, and basically just you know, thinking about location versus other, <coughs> other parks we have that are similar in nature. So thank you. And again, this is not uh, lobbying for support. It's informational purposes, no actionable items. Just uh, clarify the, the issue. Alderman Patrigula. Yeah, just four quick questions. I appreciate the clarification. And 
Um, I'm less negative than I was before <laughs> right now. Uh, first question is, um, how uh, tightly do we have to adhere to the two-acre rule? Well, I guess we depend if we want the money. It's, it's a rule. It is part of the contract that we entered into with the federal government. 2.0 acres. Right, correct. Okay. Um, when was the promise made that we would have a two acre, 2.0 acre? It was part of the application we made. So when, when did that start? When did it start? When, when was that specifically inserted in there? Did we know? It was part of, the, I mean, the date? I don't right. know. I mean, it was part of the ongoing discussions that we had with the community. We put together the, the I don't know how many hundred page document to submit right. to HUD, and that was part of, that was part of the, 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 the application process. Was there a formal date for that? Do we, do for we the know? deadline to submit it? Right. October 20 something? Oh. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor and Alderman Quadragula, do you happen to know the date? John, I know you're new here as well, but uh, while you're thinking about that, the way that the application was developed over multiple months, and I'm, I'm thinking 14 to 18 months, is uh, the information about the park was put in, it was reviewed, it was scored, it was awarded. When the city signed the, essentially, the contract, if you will, it consummated its guarantees on all the NDR projects and the program in, in total in exchange for the award. Okay, okay. I, I want to say that happened October. I think it was October of 2015. Is my I think best that's correct. Okay. Um, third question was, um, how how is downtown defined? And in the Renaissance Zone, we've exercised flexibility in defining that. Um, does it strictly have to be in that original town site, or can it be farther away, like the old Eric Ramstead site? Um, Mr. Mayor and Alderman Padragula, the downtown site it, or downtown location can be described in a number of different ways: Central Business District, Downtown District, Renaissance District. So that's, that's sort of up to us. As long as we're adhering with the, the guidelines that we submitted the application and it got scored on, uh, we have some flexibility there. The convention at the moment is to try to keep this in the, the core, if you will, or what we call the central business district. And the reason that is, is um, to try to keep that as a, to draw people into the central core and use, use it to build synergy off of both our economic center and now housing and recreation centers. Keep in mind that we're also trying to build resilience with our downtown, and that means not just business resilience, but recreational resilience and also um, housing resilience. So, you know, had the parking garages gone vertical with those apartments, we'd have, you know, a couple hundred new apartment complex, com, uh, apartments at both of those complexes. There's uh, other sites that are being contemplated for housing downtown, so we've, we sort of see this as a win-win on all those fronts. Final question was, um, what about the uh, area north of the high school that has some green and a big fence around it already? And I think north of, technically north of the North school. of the central <laughs> campus. The right. central campus oh, the property we've talked about. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Alderman Padragula, that site was looked at. This is the uh, athletic field for yes. central campus. Uh, I will say that uh, Dr. Vollmer and his team have been very great, f gracious to us in entertaining that as a site. It's about the same size. Uh, they do need that to run their operation, so have informed us that they need uh, the hours between roughly about 9 o'clock and 4 o'clock for that site to be held exclusively for uh, school district activities. That violates the HUD rules and therefore does not allow us to pursue that site any further because according to HUD, the gathering space must be open to everyone during all normal operating hours and of course we can't comply with that. Uh, so that site has been removed from further consideration. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions, uh, Alderman Berg? Just one quick comment. Every downtown business owner that I've talked to, several residents downtown, um, they're in favor of this park being kind of exclusively downtown in our area. And I think a lot of them have wanted it for a long time. And so it's exciting to see this. So thank you for putting this together. Uh, you know, it's being part of the many, many, many meetings that we had putting together that that um, proposal, um, whether it's it's in the letter of the of the proposal or the spirit of the proposal, this park was always meant to be in downtown. It was always meant to be um, to to help um, rehabilitate downtown, to bring 
activity downtown to all of those things again to be resilient um, and and uh, I think we're obligated if not by the letter of the proposal certainly by the spirit of the proposal that uh, it remained within the, that downtown the what you've designated as, as the downtown corridor or area Alderman uh, straight did you have a comment uh, mr. mayor mr. Barry I, I guess if I'm going to speak from a resident standpoint the worst thing for us is we have to answer questions all the time from residents about frustrations and I think the concern that I convey to you is the cake is baked for a lot of residents so it's hard for us to sell something when the perception is it's already done it's slapped it's guaranteed so I I appreciate you bringing more to us tonight take it public let's take it public we're having housing meetings we're talking about the homeless shelter let's start talking about this openly and conveying to the public these are the requirements these are the parameters and and that's that's the key to this being successful because we can build anything we can spend the money but we want to get people downtown and it just gets us off to the wrong foot when the residents come to us and say hey the cake's baked you're going to Trinity you didn't even ask us so that's that's the concern mr. mayor Alderman Strait, with all due respect, I would say that the amenities, the location, not in this specific location, have been baked. They were baked when the application was submitted. This community had countless meetings where people came out, were involved, and engaged in identifying the general location and the general amenities. It's a matter of simple costing. Sure. If we want to locate and put, put four million dollars of the six million into demolishing buildings and clearing those sites, the community would like to do that we can certainly do that we are attempting as a staff in the first pass to identify viable sites and not waste the community or council's time in entertaining sites that just won't work uh, and as you can see from the maps that we've drawn up the number of those viable sites are extremely limited when we put all the constraints that this these guarantees that we made to HUD in the community uh, in the siting criteria so this isn't about trying to be clandestine. This isn't about trying to hide or work behind cloaks and daggers and that sort of thing. This is about openly discussing what the viable sites are. And I have had multiple conversations with this council to do just that. As we further refine these search criteria, we find more limitations that constrain the viable sites available to us. I don't want that to be confused with the cake is baked because it's not. And if this council should direct, or the community for that matter, should convince this council to direct our efforts elsewhere, we can certainly do that. But uh, we'd need to have that direction. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Mr. Berry? Thank you, sir. Thank you. And item number four, authorized revision to approve Hydric Homes fifth edition flat development agreement. The item by with us. Second. Seconded by Hedberg. Any discussion? Any discussion? Call the roll. With us? Yes. Berg? Yes. Franswell? Yes. Hedberg? Yes. Janser? Yes. Cosen? Yes. Lehner? Yes. Olson? Yes. Panko? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Schuler? Yes. Shimento? Sitma? Yes. Straight? Yes. Motion carries. Item number 16 is adjournment. Mayor. Alderman with us. Move adjourned. Oh, I'm sorry. I had the different. Uh, sorry. Mr. Strait. Thank has, you. Has a, has a Mr. Mayor, I know it's been a long night for everyone. Well, I switched agendas halfway through and I shouldn't have It's done. okay. As many of you in the audience know, tomorrow we have our sales tax ad hoc committee meeting. And it's come up uh, through public forums and other ways. It's my understanding in April of 2012, this body made a resolution or a commitment to building flood protection to the 2011 flood of record. And tonight I would like, as we all kind of close out our terms, uh, I would like to make a, a, a declaration again, sticking to that we are going to build flood protection to the 2011 flood of record and guide not just the ad, ad hoc meeting tomorrow, uh, but city staff, Mr. Jonas and Mr. Ackerman have worked very hard in soliciting funds for this project and I would like to see this body once again make a declaration that we're going to build flood protection to the 2011 flood of record. 
if that's possible, if people want to make a commitment to I, that. I don't, I mean, I don't, I mean, we've been, those actions have been made over and over. We've got committees in place where I, half of my report was talking about the meetings I had with Senator Hoven. I, I mean, I, this just seems like, uh, I, I, I can say that, Mr. Mayor, but you'd be surprised at the ad hoc meeting where uh, a, a member of the committee who is a well-respected gentleman is, is asking Mr. Barry, well, if we know what we're going to build, let's have a conversation. But he's questioning, well, and, and it's, been, it's been questioned about, are we going to build flood protection for the 2011 flood record? Alderman Hedberg, did you have, you were raising your hand. Thank you. I think we've already done that, haven't we? Haven't we committed to, to doing that? I think with, we've done it many uh, times. I don't know that we need to do that again. Alderman Laner? Well, the only thing I was going to say is my understanding is the first four phases that we've already got funded are being built for the flood of 2011 record. And the water comes from the west and goes to the east, so it would be really dumb not to build the rest of the flood protection to the same level because then it would just come in the back door and around. So I assume we're already doing that since I'm in the other phases that haven't been built yet. I'm banking on that's going to happen in the next city council. I better do that or else I shall keep them out. And having said all that, Alderman Strait, you're open to make a motion. If I, you so I would desired. like to make a motion right now that we build the entire uh, Cirrus Valley Basin-wide Flood Protection Plan to the 2011 flood of record. Again. Is there a second? I'll second that so we can talk about it because it's an important thing for him and for okay. maybe others. I think okay. you should have the right to have Seconded by Padragula. Discussion? Further discussion, I guess. Alderman Schuler. Thank you. I wonder, um, I know that um, I'm committed that I won't be serving here next month, um, but I wonder if maybe this is something like a feel good motion, not that I'm discounting anything you're saying but specifically because that east side doesn't have a defined flood protection at this time. And even if I'm not serving in this position, I would support finishing that east side as well because it's just as important that we don't have water coming back to get the west side after we get that 60% done. So I feel like I understand why you're making a motion, but like the mayor said, if that commitment has been made, and I feel like it might be a little redundant making it again. I want to clarify that the commitment that was made was border to border. Um, but I recognize your motion and any further discussion? Alderman Francois. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The motion might be better off when the new council is seated as well. New form of government is in place. This body, as it sits, has already made their decision, showing support for that. And so when the new council comes on board with the new form of government, with the the, the six member and the mayor voting, it might be better suited then rather than now and mean more than, you know, now that we've got the new new bodies in place, new form of government, I want to recommit. I want this body to recommit what the previous council did. I think you'd be better off doing it that way than, than doing it this way. Because this body has done it, has already committed and I'm sure remains committed. Further discussion? Further discussion? Yeah, I agree with you, Mr. Mayor, that I think it is redundant, but I also um, hear the voices of a lot of people who are concerned. I don't see it mattering much either way, but I think if it, if it helps reassure the public, I'm certainly willing to support it. Again, I don't think it's necessary, but I, you know, from our perspective, but from other people's perspective, it might help them be a little bit more comfortable. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else? on the floors to pledge um, building the flood protection in the city of Minot to the flood of record in 2011. Call the roll. Street? Yes. Linus? Yes. Berg? Yes. Francois? Yes. Hedberg? Yes. Janser? Yes. Cosen? Yes. Lehner? Yes. Olson? Yes. Panko? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Schuler? Yes. Shimento? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Motion carries. Um, Mr. Mayor. Alderman with us. I move adjourn. I second that. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye.